kids uh, five years and younger, uh, you're dismissed. You guys can go back to your class. It includes babies as well. You can go back to the nursery. However, um, kids are always welcome here, okay? Kids are always welcome. Babies are always welcome here. Always welcome to stay. If y'all want to go back, y'all can go back. Hey, speaking of which, kids, um, y'all went back to school last week, uh, I, th- I think, if I, if I have my timeline correct. How many people went back to school last week? Okay, all right. Back to school. Hey, you know what? Pastor Zach used to be sad when summer was over and I had to go back to school. I remember those days. But you know what? <clears throat> You're going to have many more summers, okay? There's going to be another summer coming and many more summers after that. But don't pass up this time that you go get to learn about all the things that God has created. Don't pass up that time. That's some joys there, too. You know, God created math, for those of you who love numbers. He even uh, has a book about it in here. (laughs) Created value. Numbers. Yeah, I'll tell you, it was science. Yeah, that's just the discovery of all the things that God has made. History, all the ways in which God has moved and acted in our world. I'll tell you what, uh, when you go to school, when you study, I, I promise you the rest of your life is going to be a life of study and discovery. Discovering all the more of what God has created. And you know what? We become better worshipers of God for it. Yeah. We do. As we learn more about this amazing creation that he has made. All learning finds its end in theology and doxology. That is, all learning points us to God and to the worship of God. Well, our summer also came to an end uh, last week with a trip to North Carolina. Thank you all uh, for that time away. It indeed was a good time just to worship God and his creation at the beach. That's one of my favorite places to worship God, is at the beach. So thankful also to worship with Restoration Church. That was the church down there in Wilmington, North Carolina, that invited us to come down, that wanted to be a blessing uh, to us, and and invited us and also paid uh, to put us up there. So it was just uh, a great congregation. They were very hospitable, very generous, laid their hands and prayed for us. But you know what? They're half our size. Just blew me away. Just think, man, your, your little church just being so generous, pouring out blessing on us. Uh, I, I tell you what, when I tell the stories of all the ways in which uh, people have been pouring out blessing uh, and have been so generous to our church, to Veritas, it blows, it blows people away, even other church planners. Blown away by it. And even when I just tell them about us meeting here rent-free, they're like, really? That's crazy. I'm like, yeah, and, and like the chairs too. And like when we get more people, they, they said, hey, we'll get more chairs for you. Like for launch Sunday. Really? I mean, Pastor John asked me every week, is there, any, is there any way we can serve you? Anything else you guys need? Man, so generous. But let us never forget, okay? Let us never forget. We are being blessed so that we might be a blessing to others. Okay, let's not hog it all for ourselves. All right? But we are being blessed so that we might be a blessing. Amen? Great. Hey, last time we were together, uh, we learned that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that we're not going to be some Burger King church. (laughs) You remember that? Burger King uh, church. In other words, it's not, it ain't going to be everything about having it your way. Right? We don't need to have it our way. Instead, our prayer is, Lord, you have it your way. You have it your way. You have our lives. You have our church. You have it all for your glory. But I'll tell you what, if we want to bear fruit, if we want to bear much fruit for the God, we're going to need to remain connected to him, specifically to Jesus. Because apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. It's, It's not enough that we've just come to Jesus once before in our life, or that we've walked with him during one season. But no, we must come again and again and again. We must, as he says here in John 15, you can turn your Bibles there, John 15, we must abide in him. Kids, what does that mean, abide in him? It means remain in him. Abide in him, remain connected to him. 
abide in him, remain in him. And that might sound easy, but I tell you what, it is one of the most difficult things that our fickle hearts ever try to do, to remain and abide in Jesus. Oh, our hearts are so disloyal, aren't they? So unfaithful, so fickle and fleeting. It's one of the most hardest things. Man, it's a fight. John 15 tells his disciples, abide in me. Why? Because I am the true vine. <laughs> I am the true vine. So we continue in our I am uh, series. I am the true vine. And this time he actually tells us a little something about the father also. He says in John 15, 1, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. He's the owner of the vineyard. I am the true vine. And let me tell you something about my father. He is the vine dresser. I know what some of you are thinking. What better chapter for a church plant in Warrington than to be talking about a vineyard? Amen. Y'all know a two, thing or two about vineyards, don't you? Mm-hmm. Okay, we got to go back time to confession? Oh, no. okay. I, I looked it up a couple months ago. I think there's like 27 different uh, wineries in Fauquier County. I think that's an old list, and I think some others uh, have popped up since then. Let's just say about 30. Is that all right? Anybody uh, know a uh, more accurate number? Maybe you've been to all of them. <laughs> you can pull out your... However, that's not counting all the churches, which are God's vineyard. It's God's vineyards. God, when God plants churches, he plants a vineyard. Jesus is the vine. God the Father, the vine dresser, the owner of the vineyard. And our job to bear much fruit for him. To produce good fruit. Why? So he can make good wine. Our desire must be, as a church, to produce good fruit. And a lot of it. High quality, high quantity. Not for our own sake, but for the Lord, for we are his vineyard. When people ask, I don't know if y'all know about this in Virginia, um, there's a Veritas winery. Y'all know that? Okay. Some of y'all have bottles at your house. Yeah, okay. Well, when people ask, Veritas, which one do you mean? The winery? The vineyard? Or the church? We should just say, yes. <laughs> yes. Now, I know this might be new for some of us, but God has actually referred to his people as a vineyard for a very long time. Matter of fact, ever since he brought his people out from slavery in Egypt, he called them a vineyard. Uh, Psalm 80, you can look with me. Psalm 80, verse 8 and 9. Let's give us a little background for John 15. You brought a what? Vine out of Egypt. You brought a vine out of Egypt. Then what did he do? You drove out the nations and you planted it. Where? In the promised land. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root, and then it filled the land. This describes how God planted Israel. He saved them from Egypt. He brought them out, and then he planted them. God does the planting. Church plant, okay? God does the planting. He plants them where? In the promised land. The nations that inhabited the promised land did not live for God. They did not worship him. They worship false gods. They were evil. They were evil to women, evil to children. They were wicked nations. So what did he do? He says, no, not in my land. He disinherits the nations from the land. He drives them out. And then he plants his people, his nation, his vineyard in the promised land, and he tells them to be fruitful and multiply and to bear good fruit, righteous fruit, in accordance with his law. He planted a vineyard in the promised land. Uh, but there was a problem. They were supposed to bear good fruit, righteous fruit, as those who profess to follow God should bear. But here's the problem. His people did not bear him good and righteous fruit, says the Lord himself in Isaiah chapter 5. 
in, in Isaiah chapter 5, this idea of Israel as a vineyard continues on. The Lord himself says, Isaiah 5, 1 through 7, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. So that just so you know, the reason why it didn't produce good fruit was not because of the soil. We'll continue. He dug it. He dug it. He cleared the land of stones and he planted it with choice vines. Then he built a watchtower in the midst of it so that he could watch over his vineyard and protect it. He hewed out a wine vat in it in preparation for all the grapes it would yield. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded only wild grapes. And if you see the contrast here between uh, the grapes that he was looking for and wild grapes, the, the, the only difference b between the two, wild grapes are, for one, smaller, but for two, they are bitter. They're not sweet to eat right off the vine. But domesticated, well cared for, vineyards, luscious fruit, much fruit, and sweet can pluck it right off the vine. But he says, as I looked for fruit, it didn't have the grapes that it should have had with all the care that I gave to it. But instead it produced only wild, bitter grapes. And he says, oh, and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, look, look what he says. The Lord says, judge between me and my vineyard. Whose fault is it about, about the grapes? <laughs> Did I not do my part? Am I a bad vine dresser? Have I not cared for my vineyard? Is there something wrong with me? Have I not cared for my people? Or is there something wicked and evil about this vineyard? That's what it says in verse 4. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do with my vineyard. I will remove its hedge of protection and it shall be devoured I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down I will make it a waste it shall not be pruned and cared for or hoed and briars if it's gonna bear wild grapes let the briars and thorns grow up all around it I will also command the clouds that they rain, no rain upon it, no more provision, no protection, no provision, no care of pruning. Verse 7, just so we're all clear on what we're talking about right here, this is just an illustration. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah. At this time, what he's de describing is how, remember, the kingdoms, they had separated into the northern and southern kingdom so the northern was Israel southern was Judah but they were both still in the promised land where he had planted them but neither one neither one was following him neither one was obeying him neither one even though they are considered by God his pleasant planting when he came to them and he looked for fruit what was he looking for he looked for justice but behold only bloodshed he looked for righteousness, fruit of righteousness, which was in accordance with his law, good and righteous fruit. But behold, there was an outcry of unrighteousness. Let me ask you all, what is the Lord going to do with his vineyard here? What would you do with your vineyard? What would any of the 30 vineyards do in Fauquier County? If their vineyards no longer produced good grapes? Or, or, or what would happen if they didn't produce any grapes at all? What good is a vineyard if it doesn't provide any fruit? Matter of fact, Ezekiel tells us exactly of what worth it is. He says, look, you don't go to a vineyard and chop it down to build a house. The wood is not good for really anything. If it doesn't bear fruit, you can't even use the wood. So what are you going to use it for? Kindling. Ezekiel 15, 1 through 6. I'm giving you all this background so that you can fully understand everything going on in John 15. 
Ezekiel 15 says, verse 1 through 6, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, how does the wood of the vine surpass any other wood? <laughs> In other words, how is it better? Matter of fact, it's not. The vine branch that is among the trees of the forest, is wood taken from it to make anything? Do people even take a peg from it to hang any vessel on it? No. Behold, it's given for the fire for fuel. When the fire has consumed both ends and the middle of it is charred, is it useful for anything? No. Behold, even when it was whole, it was used for nothing. How much less when the fire has consumed it and it's charred, can it ever be used for anything? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, like the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest which I have given to the fire for fuel, so now I have given up the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They bear me no fruit, and a vineyard that bears no fruit is worth nothing. And he does. He hands them over to the nations. Unfaithful and unfruitful Israel is now handed over to the nations. They've been worshiping the nation's false gods anyway, living like them, acting like them. He just hands them over. You want to be like them? live like them, love the things they love, worship the false gods they worship, he hands them over. And they are cut off. Cut off and cut down. Oh, but my goodness, do you, do you even remember how gracious God is? The God who delivered them out of slavery in Egypt, the God who parted the Red Sea so that they could walk through it and then destroyed their enemies, the God who took them into the promised land, drove out the nation so they, they could live in houses that they didn't even build, so they could actually eat and, and pull from, the, from grapes and vineyards that they did not plant. God was so gracious to them, giving them what they did not deserve, protection, provision, blessing. And they still could not produce good fruit for him. Even after being sent into exile, when the nations came in and wiped them out and took them away as slaves, yet again he brings them back. How about a second chance? They start to rebuild the temple, rebuild the city. This is Ezra and Nehemiah in your Bibles. But guess what? They yet again start worshiping false gods. They yet again are unfaithful and unfruitful to God. They yet again, by the time of the New Testament, when Jesus arrives, no one is faithful. No one is righteous. Israel is not producing any good fruit for God. And so what happens? Cut off. But then Isaiah 11.1 1 happens. Isaiah 11.1 1 happens, church. Where, where, where Isaiah says, there shall come forth a shoot. Aha, uh -huh, baby. A shoot. A baby from the stump of Jesse. What's a stump? You all know what a stump is, right? Tree cut down and then left over. Stump. The vineyard wasn't producing fruit and then cut off. But the shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch, a righteous branch arises in Israel from that vineyard. Jesus is born of Israel. Jesus is the righteous root that bears fruit to God through his branches. Ooh, buddy. All that so that you might know this. Old Testament. Israel was the vine. Ah, right? Out of Egypt, took my vine, planted in the promised land. Israel was the vine. God, the vine dresser. God's people were the branches, but they bared no fruit. So then, cut down, but arise the shoot from the house and tribe of Judah. And Jesse comes the vine, the true vine. The father's still the vine dresser. John 15, the disciples, those 12, that all around him are his branches. And many more branches to come. Oh, I want you to appreciate John chapter 15 where Jesus says, I am the true vine. Planted by my Father. I'm the true vineyard. Able to bear good fruit through its branches for the glory of my Father and for the good of the world. 
Only through Jesus, the true vine, can the world, you and I, experience blessing from God. Both Jew and Gentile alike, because all of us, Jew and Gentile, are unfaithful and unfruitful to God. But Jesus alone was the righteous one. Jesus alone was the faithful one. Jesus alone was the fruitful one. Jesus was cut off on our behalf. Jesus was cut off on the cross for our behalf so that by faith we can be grafted into the vine and into the people of God. Because we're connected to him. And through the vine of Christ, that is how the triune God blesses you with salvation, forgiveness, grace runs through the vine, the true vine of Jesus Christ, joy, peace, all the fruits of the Spirit all come through you from the triune God, through the true vine, Jesus Christ. So is that it, church? I mean, shoot, we can close in prayer now, right? Some of y'all are like, yeah, let's go. True. Connected to the vine, blessing, salvation, forgiveness, grace, joy, peace, patience. Come on. But did God plant a vineyard just to love it, protect it, bless it, and provide for it? Or has God planted a vineyard? Yes, he will love it, protect it, provide for it. But to call it to bear fruit. Oh, church, are we not called as the vineyard of God and the branches of the Lord Jesus Christ to bear much fruit for the king? However, we must abide in the vine if we're going to bear much fruit. And that's what Jesus tells his disciples. John 15, 2 through 5, every branch in me. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a branch. Say, you're a branch. You can take him, give it right back to him. Say, you're a branch too. Every branch in me, in Jesus, that does not bear fruit, he that is the father, the vine dresser, takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. He prunes. That's why it hurts so much. So that it can bear more fruit. He says in verse 3, already you're clean because the word that I've spoken to you. Only now, verse 4, abide in me. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch, you're a branch. You cannot bear fruit by yourself unless you abide and remain in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And we can do a lot of nothing in one day when we don't abide in Jesus. Branches that remain and abide in Jesus will bear fruit. And they will also be pruned <laughs> so that they can bear even more fruit. I mean, a, a Christian that is growing, is healthy and is growing, uh, is a Christian that spends time abiding in the Lord. Through what? Prayer. Reading the word. Abiding in, in his word. Prayer. And in fellowship with other saints. healthy and growing, experiencing the life-giving vine. A Christian that is growing and is fruitful, is abiding in Jesus, and is experiencing things in their life which are unfruitful, starting to get stripped away, pruned out. <laughs> Everyone can attest to the pruning process? Yeah, pruning process. Things get stripped away. Actions, attitudes, false beliefs so that we might continue to press on and bear the righteous fruit of God, the good fruit of God for him and for the world. However, Jesus also describes a Christian, a branch that is not bearing fruit. Uh, it's not being pruned either because it's not bearing fruit. They're not growing. They're not changing. They're growing actually more disconnected to Christ. And their fruit, if they have any, is wild grapes. It shows it. They're bitter. 
their words, their attitudes, their actions, even in their false beliefs. Their fears, their anxieties, their priorities in life have nothing to do with bearing fruit for God. It's just not really their concern. But verse 3 says, If you know me, if you're with me, my disciples, you are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Which can only mean, and and Jesus goes on that we're not going to get to today, to describe that the way that we uh, abide in Christ and he with us is through his proclaimed word. And the disciples' obedience to that word. We abide in Christ when we abide in his life-giving word. The word of God is living and active. And it cleanses us and it transforms us week by week, day by day, pruning away by the spirit of God and the word of God and also nourishing us in ways that only that life-giving word can do. But here's the scary thing. When a Christian removes themselves from the church, they begin to withdraw from the vineyard. When a Christian removes themselves from the word of God, they start to disconnect themselves from that life-giving vine of Christ. When a Christian does not connect to Jesus, if they're disconnected to Jesus, then maybe they're actually not a Christian. I mean, many things can grow in a vineyard. There's good soil, sunlight, and rain. But Jesus warns in verse 6, and I I could skip it, you know, but I'm not that kind of pastor. (laughs) We don't do that here. Verse 6 says, if anyone does not abide in me, gosh, the most loving thing you can ever do is tell people the truth. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned, just like Ezekiel 15. And I do believe that that fire is hellfire. Which brings up some questions, so let me give some answers. One, is it possible for a Christian to lose their salvation? No. There are many clear verses, and I don't believe this one is describing a Christian losing their salvation. I do, though, think it's possible for Christians, true Christians, to go days, weeks, and even longer separated from Christ because they're not in fellowship with the church. They're, they're not spending time with Jesus in prayer or in his word. I mean, y'all can testify to this, right? Some droughts and seasons in your life when you are not connected to the life-giving vine through the means which he has established, primarily prayer and his word and the church. So it's possible. Man, we desperately need to abide in Jesus through prayer and his word and fellowship with other believers. However, Jesus says that there are some who seem like branches. They seem like branches. I mean, they're here among us, but they don't bear fruit. And you, and you can always tell a branch by its fruit. If it doesn't bear fruit, it's not connected to Jesus. And if it's bearing fruit that's not in keeping with Jesus, maybe it's not connected to Jesus. That's why Christians are called Christians, because they bear the fruit of Christ. But we can only bear the fruit of Christ if we abide in him. And if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. And let me say one more thing. You cannot love him unless he loves you. We cannot abide in him unless he is abiding in us. Right? Gosh, it's like when these were very young very little. Little Selah even. (laughs) If I asked Selah outside to hold my hand as we cross the street, she needs to hold my hand, right? And walk with me and hold my hand. But what is actually protecting her? Her grip on me or my grip on her? But she has to hold my hand, right? So abide in Jesus. And that is the warning. Abide in Jesus. May it light a fire in us. Abide in Jesus. Get back to the word. Get back to prayer. Daily. You need him. Make a commitment to be in church. I know I'm the pastor, but you know, I mean, it's true. And hold on to Jesus. 
But more importantly, hold Jesus, hold on to us. Hold on to my family. Hold on to me. Hold on to our church. For if we abide in him, church, look, we're going to have everything that we need. We're going to have everything that we need. If we abide in him, we're going to have everything that we need. John 15, verse 7 and 8, and I will close with this, promise. Uh, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. If you abide in me and my word is abiding in you and you want to obey me, anything you ask, it will be done for you. By this my Father's glorified in heaven that you bear much fruit as his vineyard and his branches and so prove to be my disciples. Uh, Benaiah is starting to mow the grass, which is awesome. Yeah, doing a great job. Uh, see, we don't pay our kids for doing their chores. Um, like, you got to clean up your own mess. You got to clean your room, right? I mean, that's your mess. It's your responsibility. I ain't going to pay you for that. You got to clean it up. But when you start doing my jobs, my responsibility, yeah, I'll pay you for that. <laughs> but if I tell Benaiah, hey, go mow, and Benaiah doesn't have a lawnmower, all he's got to do is ask the father, and I'm going to provide him one so that he, can, that he wants to obey my word. If it runs out of gas, what's he got to do? Just come tell me. I'll provide that too. Church, Jesus says, if, my, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, then all that you want and all that you need to obey my commandments, I will do it for you. Because by this, my Father is glorified that you would bear much fruit for him. Veritas Church, I, I pray, especially in these coming weeks and coming years, that we bear much fruit for God. That we bear much fruit for him. In three weeks, we're going to plant. And before you know it, it's going to be three years. And we're going to look back and say, wow, look at all what God has done. And I pray that by his grace, I'll still be your pastor in 30 years. You're going to be stuck with me for a long time. I'll still be younger than John in 30 years. <laughs> I'm telling him I said that. But you, know, you want to know what my prayer has been for you and for our church, what I'm asking Jesus for? I'm asking Jesus to bless our church. And he's been doing it. I'm going to ask him to bless our socks off, to come and just show up and show off for his glory. Bless us so that we can be a blessing. I want to see disciples making disciples. I want to see the lost people in your life come to know Jesus. I want to see your family, your friends, your co-workers. I want to see people in Warrington, Final Fridays. I want to see them here. I want to see them come to Jesus. I want to see them baptized. I want to see them worshiping God. I want to see them living for God. I want to see them joining our church. I want to see all the little kids growing up to be the men and women that God has created them to be. All for the glory of God. I will spend the rest of my life endeavoring for that. You know what I pray for the most out of everything? My prayer for my own, for me and for my wife and for my kids and for their kids, I pray that they would abide in Jesus that we would abide in Jesus. And that's the same prayer I pray for you. Abide in Jesus. It is going to be the absolute hardest thing for your fickle heart to do. Oh, you're so prone to wander, you know it. Loves and desires go all over the place. But that's my prayer for you, that you would abide in Jesus. Pray that for you, for your marriage, for your kids, for your children's children. Then in 30 years, we'd just be abiding in Jesus. And whatever fruit he wants to bring through this church, may it be done. Let our prayer be the prayer of David. One thing I ask, and that I will seek. I could dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Lord, you truly are the desire of our hearts. You're the only one that can satisfy our souls. Lord Jesus, we need you. Lord, all of your people around this world desperately need you to be connected to the vine in order to receive all the things that we need to live out your, your word 
in a world that hates you and hates your word. Lord, no matter what the culture is doing around us, God, no matter what we go through, whatever comes our way, Lord, help us to be and to do all that you've called us to be and to do. In Jesus' name, amen.